offer these words in the name of the triune God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Well, we are in that long green season after Pentecost. And because of that, there are two tracks or strands each week for Old Testament readings that the clergy are offered to preach from. Within each track, there is a psalm chosen to accompany the particular lesson. The Revised Common Lectionary allows us to make use of either of the tracks, but it recommends that once a tract has been chosen, we have to stay with that through the end of Pentecost. So we chose track one, in which the Old Testament readings follow major stories and themes and are mostly continuous from week to week. We're in year A, and so we get to begin with Genesis, which is my favorite. The Sunday, the Old Testament reading is Genesis 12, which we just heard, which focuses on the call and the response of Abram and Sarah. God called and Abraham went. I love that. God called and Abraham went. It's so simple, but of course, none of Scripture is ever that simple. Now, last Sunday from Father Kurt, we heard about Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And from there until this morning's chapter 12 reading, we skipped many stories of sin and God's response to it. The story of Adam and Eve, of Cain and Abel, of Noah and the flood, uh, the Tower of Babel. Lots and lots of sin. And then we have Abram. The first time we hear about Abram is in Genesis chapter 11. He's one of three brothers born to Terah when he was 70 years old. We are told that Abraham took Sarah to be his wife, and that is all that we really know about them until today. And so here we are with the story of an aging man and his barren wife answering God's call. Abram left Ur in Mesopotamia because God called him to found a new nation in an undesignated land that he later learned was Canaan. He obeyed unquestionably the commands of God from whom he received repeated promises and the covenant or promise that his seed would inherit the land. An amazing story in itself. But this story is also one of great significance. The story this morning is a turning point of not only history of Abraham and of Israel and then of us, but a turning point of world history. It is what shifts it shifts what has been going on in our natural sinful nature. We are sinful. But here, God reveals to Abram his plan of redemption and his promise of blessing to fulfill his part of his covenant. Salvation history began right here. We go into the story to open ourselves to the God who is not only journeying with people, but also who is inviting people to move more deeply into embodying God's promise, which is for life, for freedom, for a kingdom reality for all of us. This is the promise of Genesis. It is a promise that says, yes, God created and the world messed up, but God isn't done with us yet and he isn't done with creation. And so we are invited to get into alignment with God's will so that we can live from that place of walking with God and walking with one another to be people of a promise. This is God's vision and God's desire. In our reading, we heard several I will statements made by God. I love these I will statements that reflect the covenant that he made with Abram and therefore with all people. I will show you the land that you are to have. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And I will curse those who curse you. I will. These promises reflect God's solidarity with Abram. And I will do all of these things, he is saying, and I will have your back. I am always with you. And then I will bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation, and through you and this great nation, I will bless then the world through them. God's covenant blessing to God's people, not just for a chosen people, but a people chosen to expand that covenant to all the world. But of course, in any covenant, 
there is the offer, and then there is the response. And when Abram heard God's voice and his call, we are told simply he went. No discussion, no argument, no questions, no complaining. He went. Abram went and traveled to Canaan, and he pitched his tent. Now, I've said many times before that Abram is not perfect. He is a sinful man, but somehow God always seems to find a way to use him for good. And I think it is because Abram listens and he acts. He makes mistakes, but he always returns to his faith in God and then works hard to live up to God's expectations. So the main point of this, and I think the rest of our readings this morning, is what does it mean to have faith? What does the love of Christ compel us to do? The same message is being shared in the Gospel of Matthew, but this time the call comes in person. Follow me, Jesus says to Matthew, the tax collector, the lowest of the low in Roman society. Take heart, your faith has healed you, Jesus tells the woman who has been sick for 12 years. The girl is not dead, she is just asleep. Jesus tells those in the synagogue. Jesus is healing and changing and resurrecting. I think that most of us know what a significant change becoming a disciple brought to the lives of those Jesus called him to follow. In our reading this morning, the depiction of Matthew's two lives are in juxtaposition, from tax collector to evangelist and servant of the church. The other two healings in our readings are just as life-changing, though unlike Matthew, we don't know the rest of their lives' stories, but we can imagine what the lives of the woman and the girl would have been like. But because of Jesus, their lives are now open with actual possibilities. Answering the call to follow Jesus is life-changing, and through this faith, we too find meaning, we find healing, And we find peace, knowing that God's promise has been made and has been kept. But we too, like Abraham, we need to do our part. For as I said earlier, every covenant has a call and a response. Now I say all of this knowing that everyone here is a disciple of Christ, or else you'd be home in bed in your pajamas probably right now. Abraham was a disciple too, and I really doubt that he had any idea what God had in store for him. And I'm sure that when Matthew left his job collecting taxes to follow Jesus' call, he had no idea how his life was going to change. And I have to wonder how the lives of the woman and the child who were healed and all their friends and their relatives, how all of their lives changed once they were open to the possibility of having faith in the healing power of God. And so I wonder if we think about what God has in store for us. Now, I've been preaching this since January, that we are in a very holy place, one is, that is open to hear God's call to teach one of us, or each one of us individually, and to us as a congregation. And I think our options are unlimited We are in a time in our church's history that's ready for change. And for that change to happen, we need to listen to God's call in our lives. For us to discern how God is calling us to step out in faith and use our gifts to help those who need to hear about God's promise of healing. For us to feel the breath of God sweep over us and fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit to invite others to experience what St. Augustine's has to offer. Now, I jokingly asked Ned Vaughn a few weeks ago if he and Adelaide were going to have any more children, because Charlotte is the one that's left other than the prodigal sons that have come home to play. I said, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they sacrificed for God's mission. I'll tell you, Ned was not amused. But all, <laughs> but all joking aside, now is the time for us to delve deeper into our own faith and to trust in God that nothing Nothing is too big for God to do if that, is plan, if, if that is in God's plan. And now is the time to cast open our sail and to be open to new possibilities, no matter how odd it may seem and how overwhelming. 
You know, sometimes I think that we, well, at least I know me, that we can be very much like the folks in the book of Genesis, where with all that is happening in their lives and in our lives and with what's going on in the world, that we often get so mired in our own stories that we sometimes lose sight of the larger picture and we forget what the promise was about, that we cannot remember and we forget when we're wandering around that we too are the receivers of that covenant that God made with Abram. And so as we are seeking to be the church, to be a people who live our lives connected to the God of the whole of all of the stories, we want to be a people of the promise, a people who remind each other that God isn't done with any of us yet, and that this blessing and that the goodness of a life lived without the trappings of ego or self-protection and all of these things, all of these things are ours. Through the promise, we are invited into freedom to walk with God, to walk with one another as we were intended to, and to be people who generously extend that promise and that invitation of the good news as we live it with one another in this world. So what does it mean for us to be a people who live this promise, to be the church, to live in such a way as to invite people and to invite ourselves to walk with God? I have faith that God is calling us to do great, meaningful things in this community. And so I ask, how is God nudging you? Amen.